Uh, one is a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to tell you some things I believe, some things that I am assuming about you and this church, um, and then give you a glimpse as to why I do what I do in ministry, and part of that overlaps with what I believe the church do in ministry. Um, my wife and I, Tammy, just moved here just a, a about a week ago, we lived just a few blocks away, but Tammy and I have been married for a little over seven years. Uh, she truly is the better part of the two of us. As you get to know us, you will agree. Um, between the two of us, we have uh, many children who are all adults and have moved out and left us empty nesters. Um, actually, not completely empty nesters because we share our house with a 10 and a half year old English bulldog by the name of Chubbs that uh, if you were on social media, you may probably have already got to see him. He has quite the personality, um, but being as though he is well advanced in age, he sleeps about 20 hours a day, which leaves the other two members of our household, Sweets and Suki, two cats, who uh, are plotting our demise as we speak. Uh, what do they say? Dogs have masters and cats have a staff. Is that right? So that is our household. We've been married for a little over seven years, and uh, Tammy is originally from the Kansas City area. I am not, and so I am getting to learn a brand new place through the eyes of the one that I love. So I'm excited to be here with you. So that's a little introduction. Now let me share with you a few things I believe. Uh, number one, I believe caffeine makes me a better person. Anybody else? How do you know it makes me a better person? You've never met me. Okay, that was a bad joke. <laughs> For me, though, caffeine, um, um, the way I get it is through a Diet Dr. Pepper, which is cold. I, I haven't drank coffee since college, but I know that many of you coffee drinkers out there that uh, caffeine is better for us. Uh, or not better, right? It just helps us be human. Uh, I also believe that if you are going to eat steak, that it should be about at least this thick and cooked medium rare. And should you come over to my house and ask for one cooked well done, I will do it for you once. I will be polite, but I might ridicule you behind your back and weep because it, it pains me to cook them that way. I believe peanut butter is good on almost anything. You put it with chocolate, that is like the Lord's meal right there. Every year about this time, I start to believe once again that my New Orleans Saints are destined to win the next Super Bowl, even though I know I'm in Chiefs country. And my wife is a Chiefs fan, ergo I'm a Chiefs fan, except for that one time every four years when they play each other. And the last two times they've done it, I have lost bets because the Chiefs have beat my Saints twice. <laughs> yeah, you clap for that one. I also believe that Salvador Perez, Salvi, is the best catcher in baseball. Period. Now, I have to confess, it's not because I have some unique knowledge when it comes to the sport and statistics. It's only because every time I watch a game and he is playing, he is infectious. There is something about him that is just, he has such a joy for the game. And that's the way a sport should be played. So there's just a little bit of things that I believe. Now, let me tell you some things that I'm assuming about you, because I've, I've had a few months to prepare for this, and, and I'll tell you I'm a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, um, but here's what I assume. I assume that this church has a very rich past, and I have heard about that in many different ways. I believe and assume that it has a great present and an unlimited future. I assume that you love your church and that you love your city and that you love each other, even though sometimes you tolerate each other. I assume that uh, some of you may be skeptical of me as that is normal anytime a change happens. But I also assume that you are going to extend me grace in this time as we are learning to uh, understand who we are as a church and, and as one another, as friends, I'm assuming that you are going to extend me grace just as I'm going to extend you the same amount of grace. I also assume that every single Sunday has the possibility to be somebody's first Sunday. 
whether in person or online, or the first Sunday in a long time, you know, certainly here, but at churches all over. And because I have that assumption every single Sunday, it changes for me part of why I worship and what I do. I assume that today is the first taste that some will have, and my hope is that it is a good taste. I assume this, that within this room and online, um, we are people who are flawed, who are hiding our hurts and our doubts, and often hiding our questions. And I assume um, that many of you are searching for a place to belong, someone to become, and someone or something to believe in. That is my assumption of you. Now, one of my regular prayers every single Sunday morning, uh, I've been doing this for years, and I did it this morning here for the very first time, while I was out in the parking lot, is to pray, Lord, help me get a clearer vision of who I am and who you are and why that matters. That is a prayer that I pray over all of you in this church. Is that when we gather, by the way, you know, today is not the last day of your weekend, right? This is the first day of your week. So when we gather at the very first of the week, my prayer is that we get a glimpse, a little better, of who we are individually and as a group, who God is, and ultimately then why that matters in the world. So that is my hope. That is my prayer. And I'd like to ask you to take a moment and take a breath and allow me to pray for us as we get into this teaching. Close your eyes with me. And if you will, if you feel so inclined, maybe lay your hands on your lap, palms up, as though you are receiving something. I pray, come Holy Spirit and speak to us today. God, come and find us right where we are. In the midst of our joy, in the midst of our fear. Find us in between our faith and our doubt. Inspire us somehow today, Lord, to better understand ourselves and you. So that when we leave, we are somehow different. So God, help us to be fully present, to maybe hear a word from you, a word of challenge, a word of comfort, a word of inspiration, or maybe even disturbance. So come, Lord, speak to us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, over time, you're going to come to know a little bit more about me and my life story and my faith story. That's just part of how this works. But for today, what I want to do is I want to start by telling you about a passage of Scripture that was very instrumental in me following my call to be a pastor and helping me understand that I can actually do this and be this. And it starts in the book of Acts, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And as the story begins, Jesus is about to ascend. He has already had the death and resurrection. He has spent some time with his disciples. He's about to ascend to heaven. And he knows that when he leaves, those who are left behind need someone, something to help guide them. And so he assures them that he's going to send an advocate, a counselor, someone else that will be that power that they need to continue this mission that he started, the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, that happened. This is how it happened. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, the, the disciples, the followers of Jesus. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Some of your translations will say, like, tongues of fire rested on their heads, which, if that happened to us here, would freak you out. It just would. So this is what happens. It comes in, the tongues of fire. It says, all of them then were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. It continues on. It says, now there were others stayed in Jerusalem that were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came to them in bewilderment because each one of them had heard the others speaking to them in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not these men all speaking Galilean? And if so, then how is it that we each hear them in our own native language? And here's why this verse spoke to me, and here's why it continues to drive me today. 
this day called Pentecost. And we've celebrated this in the church not too long ago, but we call this the birthplace of the church. It is seven days after the ascension of Jesus. The disciples are all together. They're in an upstairs room, windows closed, doors closed. This wind comes in and causes a commotion. And next thing you know, the people who are there are able to speak. They are either able to speak completely different languages or they speak their language. And yet somehow people all around could hear them as though they are speaking their native language. Something out of the ordinary happened. Something incredible happened. And something out of the ordinary happened to me when I realized that for me to really show people this Jesus that saved my life, that it was going to take another language that I was not raised in and that I didn't know. And that it was okay to use my language that others might find a little unorthodox. So it still drives me. Now listen, it's not a brand new language, discarding the old one. No, it's an additional one that comes alongside, that helps others understand and to tell you about all of that. I to tell you about a few things that might not seem like they go together, but bear with me. I want to tell you about cows. I want to tell you about fences. I want to tell you about gray area and about music. Is that okay? Let's start with cows. Why does this have to do with language? In Australia, they have a huge cattle industry that, that it may be in some ways larger than America. But one of the big differences between Australian ranches and American ranches is that in America, our ranches, while they may be large, they're not as large as brothers and sisters in Australia. And what they have learned is that to put fences around all of their property would be so expensive, they can't afford it. They've developed another way to keep the cows at the ranch. Here in the U.S., you drive through the country and you see barbed wire fences, unless they have more money. And then you see the white fences that makes you, if you were from the 80s, makes you sing the Dallas theme song every time you drive by. I do it. But over there they go. And what they've discovered is if you want to keep the cows where they belong and not intermingling with other herds is they have learned to drill a well to actually create a space where the life-giving water that they crave is actually there at their convenience. If you dig a well, the cows will stay. That is what they've learned. This is a similar metaphor to something that, that Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch, they write about this concept called bounded sets and centered sets in their book, The Shaping of Things to Come. And to paraphrase it, what they describe is that this is a common thing around humanity, is that bounded sets are about fences and boundaries. You are either in or out based on set criteria as if you are doing certain things. If you're doing the right things, then you are in the boundary. If you are not, then you are out. That is a bounded set. If you believe the way I believe, then you are in. If you don't, you're out. You understand this, right? If you vote the way I do, you're in, right? And if you vote the way I don't, then you are out. This is a bounded set. The opposite is a centered set way of thinking, they describe. And a centered set way of thinking is not about certain beliefs and certain actions. It's all about orientation. Orientation as into the way that you are pointed and directing towards. It's the movement that you're making forward. And as long as you are making forward movement to the common goal, to the well, no matter how far away you are from it, you are all still a part of that set. It's not about building a fence around it. It's about there is the center. Let's move forward towards it. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, Jesus and his followers are there, and they are attending another festival. It, it, when you get into the, our ancestry of, of Jewish heritage, you will see festivals for all sorts of things, rich things. And this particular one is called the, the Festival or the Feasting of Tabernacles. And, and, and it's a week long, and they have different things, ceremonies that happen. And one of them um, is this symbolism where they go and they draw water from the well of Siloam, and they bring it in. It helps remember their exodus and the water that was provided. By the way, this festival is often, uh, in the Hebrew word, is Sukkot. Uh, I tell you that from time to time because you may want to impress people online or at work. But they, they draw water. Another important uh, ritual in this is the lighting of huge candelabras. 
and just be vessels of oil to illuminate the temple. It was a reminder to them that in their time of the wilderness and the exodus that God actually led them in a pillar of fire. And then another tradition in this is they would build these temporary structures called the sukkahs. And they were, they were crude, kind of like when you go tailgating and you put up a pop-up tent. Um, they didn't have pop-up tents, but it was these, these transitional sort of things that were intended, again, to remind them that as they were going through the wilderness, they were only there temporarily. And so there at this festival, there's this incredible um, correlation between what had happened in the past and what Jesus was doing in the current. You see, because in Jesus, God dwelled among us. He, in a crude, temporary form, in a body that is not eternal, God chose to walk the earth with us and for us in this lowly, frail frame. The glory of God, the power of God, the very presence of God showed up. And when Jesus was there at this festival, standing in the temple, claiming to be what he called the light of the world, he was making a radical statement to people back then. He was using language that, that went against their good senses. Because to say that Jesus never claimed he was God means you haven't really wrestled with this passage. Because for him to stand in the middle of the temple, in the middle of this festival, and say, I am the light of the world, is like him saying, I am the pillar of fire who led you out, who gave you life. And then, at the same festival, he deliberately used this time to speak about himself to anyone who would listen. And on the very last day, he stood up and it said that, that he cried out, meaning loudly, if anyone is thirsty, come to me. If you believe in me, come and drink. For the scriptures declare that rivers of living water will flow out from within. In cow speak, Jesus is a well. He is a center. When we look at Jesus and, and how he interacted with people, individuals, and groups, it was easy to tell that he wasn't so concerned about bounded sets that you have to believe this one particular way or you're in. It wasn't about fences and who's in and who is out. In fact, it was pretty clear that back in that day, Jesus spoke against many people who thought they were in and yet were mistaken because they were out. They thought they had the right beliefs, but they weren't really oriented towards the right well. And wells. Now, in 2006, a little history on myself. Um, me and a group of people, we started a ministry in downtown Joplin with a bunch of people who never started anything. Um, we started something we called the Salvage Yard. And in a nutshell, it was a, a nightclub, coffee house, and church all in one. When I say nightclub, it's non alcoholic because we're Methodists and we don't do those things. Well, on church property. Um, <laughs> But we, it, some would say it was the church going downtown in a trash suit dress to hang out for the night. And so we would do that. We, we'd have live bands and open mic nights, an occasional comedian, um, and worship services. And, and just a little side note, it was amazing to me how we'd have all these different rock-type bands. And yet the one time a year we got a bluegrass band in there, it was packed. People love bluegrass for some reason. And I think it's because you can never do a sad song with a banjo. That has nothing to do with this. <laughs> But at the salvage yard, we, we had these nights of worship. And on one particular Sunday night during worship, um, a couple of our regulars were outside on the sidewalk. And often people would walk by and they would welcome them and say hello and invite people in. And, and on this particular night, a man walks by and they say hello to him and they introduce themselves. And they invite him in and he's looking for a bar. At that time, there weren't many bars in Joplin that were open on Sundays. I don't know if they are here in in uh, Kansas City, but they weren't there. And uh, so we often got people looking for a bar because quite frankly, we look like a bar. And, and so he's there, he's talking with the people. They're like, hey, you should come in with us. We're having this worship service. And he's like, nah, man, I just smoked a joint in your parking lot. You don't want me. And, and the two people there were, one was great, the other one was greater uh, because they're like, no, man, we want you to come in. It is okay. But the, the greater one says, besides, we have cookies. <laughs> Which means half the room here knows what possumokers do. He, he didn't enter the doors that night, but many did. 
And in general, our rule was this. If you are high, if you are drunk, if you are altered in any way, you are welcome there. We would rather have you with us safe and, and, and not in the streets where you may be in danger, unless, of course, you're a troublemaker. And that was a whole other story for another day. But honestly, where we were at, most organizations could care less about somebody walking down the street that was high. They could care less. They just want to make sure that they just kept walking. But for us, we did care. And, and we loved people. And we hoped for people. And we prayed with people. And, and we weren't like any other church that the city had ever seen. And churches were a little confused by us. And the local Bible college actually told their students two words that we were. They said it was gray area. It was a language they didn't understand. Generally speaking. In America, especially in the Midwest, I have never lived on the coast, but in the Midwest, we struggle with gray area. We do. We're either black or white. And I'm not talking about skin pigmentation. That's a whole other day. But we, are, we call it black or white. Yes or no. Right or left. Right or wrong. Right? We want clearly defined lines to live by. We want bounded sets. Am I right? We do. It makes life easier. To have clearly defined lines. It helps us know who's in and who's out. And if I'm doing the right thing, we don't like the gray area. Churches, especially like the black and white, in order for us to make our ways of doing faith easier, we do our best to define our rules to make sure that individuals and organizations live in what we call orthopraxy, which is just a churchy word that helps us to define the right ways to practice your faith in the right ways. As opposed to orthodoxy, which is making sure that you believe the right way. That's what the church has historically always done. Here's what I believe to my core. I prefer digging wells. Wells that people are drawn to rather than building fences saying, if you're just like this, then you are welcome. I prefer to dig wells because I believe Jesus did not call us to exclude anybody. From his grace. I like how you say it around here. It's one of the first things I learned about you. You said Keystone is, is creating a Christ-like culture where grace comes first. And where ordinary people are transformed by Christ for the transformation of the world. Centered sets, wells, are all about grace. And bounded sets are about grace as well. But as long as you look like, believe like, sing like, vote like. Live like I do. And I believe that we are called to be so much more than that. I believe that our job as Christians, for me personally, and my hope for this church is to say, come, come and believe. We might believe a little bit differently, but come anyways. And let's point ourselves towards the will, towards the one who it has the potential to change us all. Believe, I believe, is important. But I believe it happens the most the closer you get to a center. And that is my hope. Which brings me to music. There is something about music. Um, I, I, I thought music today was incredible. And I, I tell you that because I come from a worship culture that doesn't do high church. I, I really enjoyed this. But there's something about music that I believe speaks to our souls in ways that any preacher can't. For instance, I know that any one of you, at any moment, you will turn on the radio in your car or at home, and you will hear a song from your past, and whether you've thought about it or not, in 30 years, you will instantly sing every word along with it. Am I right? And yet, you're going to go home today, and you're going to forget everything I said. <laughs> There's something about music, isn't there? And melody... And rhythm. There's something about songwriters who have the ability to put words to all of this that somehow connects with you in a way that you feel like it could have been your very own words. And when your favorite musician dies, you mourn. Why? Because they feel like they are a part of the family. I think it's because somehow, some way, they have this gift to articulate for us how we feel. But we don't know how to express it. They have the ability to tell our story in rhythms and in rhymes that, that our souls connect to. And 
I believe in some ways that God is this melody as well that has gone throughout all the world and all time. And throughout time, people have tried their best to catch a glimpse of it. It's a voice. It's a rhythm. It's something drifting in the air. And on occasion, we hear it. We get a glimpse of it. Again, in John's Gospel, Jesus said this, and you heard this. This is our Bible reading today. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. He says, and I'll lay down my life for the sheep. But I also, he says, have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. And listen to this. They hear my voice. They listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus even recognized that there are people out there that they hear me and they don't quite understand it. They hear it. They, they know it. They, there's something about it. It might seem elusive. It might feel like it's something on the tip of their tongue. You see, God, to me, is a lot like a melody. I'm going to explain this to you with a little aid. And uh, I guess it's only right that I apologize to you up front for what you're to experience. Let's see if I can do this without tripping myself. In uh, the best way I can describe this is God is this four chords over and over. C, G, and A minor, and F. And I always like to tell people when they first encounter me doing music, one, I apologize. And um, for you musicians out there, give me some grace because I taught myself to play guitar and I know I don't do it right. Um, but there's still this melody that has gone over and over over and over, and we hear it in different ways. Anybody have their early adulthood or childhood in the 80s? Anybody? You've heard this. You might not recognize it, but you've heard it. It sounds like this. You're just a small town girl. You know this one? Living in a lonely Took the midnight train going anywhere. Come on, if this was on the car, you'd know it. You're just a city boy, born and raised in South Detroit. He took the midnight train going anywhere. All right, I'll stop there. Because it's not just our rock and roll friends that hurt us, it's others as well. Our country brothers and sisters have heard this in many different ways. One in which goes like this. Country road, take me home. You know this one? To the place I belong. West Virginia, mountain mama, take me home. Country road. And I'm not going to be arrogant enough to think that it's just us in America that have heard this. People throughout the centuries have heard this. Even in that country that we celebrate our independence from today, they've heard this. These four guys from England said it this way. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary, come to me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. In my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. In church, we have a different word for let it be, right? It's amen. Um, so in the 90s, there was this lady who heard this and had some very honest questions. And, and I remember hearing about this actually in a church setting and somebody chastising it. Because how dare they ask such things? It was blasphemous. And what she said was this. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. 
just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. friends from Jamaica have heard it this way. No woman, no cry. No woman, no cry. Here, little darling, don't shed no tears. No woman, no cry. Now, I need to really apologize for what's to come. Because as I've gotten older, what I've realized is, um, I don't fully understand the younger generation. I don't, and, I, and now I understand why my parents were the way they were with me. But they hear it. They hear this same melody. They have different words to it, but it's the same melody. Um, and again, I apologize, but it goes like this. I came in like a wrecking ball. I never hit so hard. <laughs> Are you ever, <laughs> all you ever did was wreck me. You see, I know, that's terrible. <laughs> see, to me, God is a melody, a rhythm. And I spent much of my life getting glimpses of it. And yet somehow, because I didn't fit within the fences, and belong. God is this melody that you've been hearing, and maybe you don't even know it, but it's there. And so my challenge for you is this, as, as we leave our time today, if you are a follower of Jesus, either for a short time or a very long time, keep following, but be careful. Be careful what fences you put around your faith that will prevent other people from discovering the well. Keep listening for that melody, and in those moments that you get it, share it with people. Yeah, it'll weird them out, but share it anyway. If this is your first time, or your first time in a long time to hear about Jesus, know this. It is okay to not have the answers to start to point towards the well. It's okay to be afraid. It is okay to have doubts. It is okay to not be okay. And I believe that the church, this one, any church, should be the safest place to come hear a life-changing message of the well, the water of life. So come. Hear the melody. See the light. Drink from the well of living water. God walked among us as Jesus, and he still lives among us as his spirit. And so I am honored and excited and still a little bit scared to be joining you on this mission. And as we live this out together, may you and I, week by week, get a better glimpse of who we are and who God is and why that matters. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.